Hello, and welcome to week two, FINA H101, Art Appreciation, uh, from IPFW. This is Aaron Schwartz again, and this week our topic is Art as Subject, Talking About Art, which is a little bit different from what we did last week, Describing Art. Specifically, this week we're going to be discussing art criticism and aesthetics two of the major ways that visual art is conceptualized and talked about by cultural commentators. Art criticism is defined as the evaluation and discussion of art. Aesthetics is the study or philosophy of beauty in art. So with those uh, differentiations in mind, let's move on and jump right in, looking at a piece by Claude Monet. The first work of art we're looking at this week is by Claude Monet and is a great example of Impressionist art, which many of you may have heard of previously. Impressionism is a type of modern art in which artists modify traditional color and brush stroke to experiment with optics and create the impression of what, was, of what it was the human eye actually sees. So there's less attention to detail and more of an effort to capture the fleeting effects of light and to create an impression of what it was like to see a particular scene in a particular moment. This is what I meant last week when I said that realism was surprisingly subjective. Although this landscape does not include sharp detail, it still represents atmosphere and the way humans see in a realistic way. Even though this painting was created over a hundred years ago in 1899, it's an example of modern art. We define modernism as both an era and a type of art associated with the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Modernism came about when artists began to experiment with new ways of making art that would reflect the technology, ideas, and experience of the modern industrial era in which they lived. Impressionist artists like Monet, by painting in the way they did, were challenging artistic traditions and had a crisp, detailed style of painting that had been in place for hundreds of years. So although his bridge over a pool of water lilies looks like a simply pleasant and beautiful landscape, don't be fooled. It was quite daring and cutting edge at its time. Now I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, how is this modern? You can take my word for it, or does it just look old-fashioned to you? And what do you find beautiful about this work? Is there anything that you think is ugly or unpleasant about it? I ask because in the era in which it was created, the beginning of modernism, many people thought this was a terribly ugly way to paint. Can you imagine what people in the late 19th century might have found ugly about Monet's painting? Take a moment to organize your thoughts, and then we'll move on to the next slide. What you're seeing on this slide are several quotes from Clive Bell in the early 20th century. Uh, go ahead and pause the video and read these quotes so that you understand them. I'm not going to take the time to read it all to you. If they aren't making any sense to you, and you haven't read your assignment from the textbook, you might want to read that back over before proceeding. After you've read these quotes, and you've considered what he's talking about, what he means here, uh, all of these quotes deal with the topic of, what is beauty? According to Clive Bell, what does beauty have to do with art? It's going to be important that you understand Bell's point of view here. So take a moment to make sure you understand through your textbook and through these quotes here uh, what beauty has to do with art. And then we'll move on to the next slide. In the reading, Bell brings up and defines a few terms. That emotion is the emotional response to a particular form or set of forms. This is a kind of gut reaction that you have to an artwork immediately when you look at it. Significant form describes the series of lines and colors arranged in such a way as to provoke that aesthetic emotion. He also talks about post-impressionism. 
which is kind of a catch-all term to use to describe separate artists, including Cezanne, who you see, uh, whose work you see on the right, working after Impressionism, to separate that from academic, which is a style of art produced in the academies. Art academies were schools that were the primary source of art education before modernism, and they are known for a very realistic, traditional, and conservative style the opposite of the new and challenging modern style. So I'd like you to look at these two paintings and consider which one arouses your aesthetic emotion. Which one do you, to, to use a term that's often thrown around in art circles, which one speaks to you uh, and do you find the most meaningful to you? In addition to identifying which evokes a stronger emotional reaction, consider what specifically about the painting is creating that emotion in you. Is it the content, the subject matter, the color, form, style, light? Maybe it's something else entirely. Keep in mind that your aesthetic emotion does not necessarily have to be a positive response. One of these paintings could make you feel fear or melancholy or joy and delight. You might be surprised by your response. So there are two parts to this. What is your aesthetic response? What sort of emotion do you get from these paintings? And then what is it about the paintings? What is it about the way that they're created uh, that that is actively creating that emotion in you? So again, stop take a moment to consider that, jot down some ideas, then we'll move on. Here are some quotes by Jean-Paul Sartre. Again, pause the video and take a moment to read these quotes before you go on. Now consider, how does Sartre offer a counterpoint to Clive Bell? That is, how do they differ in their opinions on how art relates, uh, relates to beauty? You might want to go back and read the bell quotes uh, and really compare what these two authors are trying to say. I'd like to introduce two terms now that are, help, that are helpful in discussing the different opinions of Sartre and Bell, uh, as well as the different opinions amongst many of you regarding which painting you preferred in the last slide. First is the term subjectivity, meaning personal or individual understanding of something. The other term is taste, not referring to your favorite flavor of ice cream, but one's critical judgment or appreciation of a work of art. You might want to think about also and comment on what has shaped your taste in art. And for that matter, what is your taste in art? You might not know the answer to this right now, but you should develop a better idea of it over the semester. Given what we've seen so far, do you seem to prefer more uh, detailed scenes, brightly colored scenes? What sort of styles have been appealing to you over other styles? Uh, for me personally, I respond very strongly to bright colors, expressive line, and abstraction. But many of you listening probably um, have very, very different tastes in art. So further, try to think also, what is it about your background, uh, the way you grew up, uh, your experiences with art in the past that might have shaped your taste in art? Uh, again, like I mentioned last week, a lot of you probably just aren't uh, comfortable or familiar with really thinking about art in this way. Uh, but that's going to be a process of this course of art appreciation, really breaking down our understanding of why we view art the way we do uh, and how it is the artist is drawing those feelings out of us. This is a painting by Vincent van Gogh, uh, whom many of you may have heard of before. It's called The Night Café and was painted in 1888. Now, before I tell you anything else about this, I want you to pause this video, look at this painting closely, and write down your initial thoughts about it. Do you find it beautiful? Does it touch on any emotions? Uh, really give me your gut reaction. Now that 
that you've taken the time to write down your reaction to the Night Cafe, uh, read these quotes here. These are by Vincent himself, written in a letter to his brother Theo, describing that painting you were just looking at. Take a moment to read them. So I'm going to guess that many of you may have had a positive emotional response to Van Gogh's painting. Maybe some of you even thought it was beautiful. Personally, I kind of like the contrasting colors and the awkward vantage point. I think it makes it dynamic and interesting. But, as you can read here in these uh, quotes, the artist himself described it as one of the ugliest paintings he ever made. And he wasn't trying to present a positive, cozy environment, but instead a very sad and terrible place. So what we want to consider here is artist's intent. Now that you know what Van Gogh wanted to do in his painting, and that he wanted to create an ugly and terrible scene, does it change the way you look at the painting? And do you think it's possible for somebody to see this painting as beautiful, in spite of his intentions to show something ugly? On this slide, we're looking at two very different sculptures here, but they're both what we call pietas. A pieta is a mother and child scene, and it's usually the Virgin Mary with the dead body of Christ in her arms after he's been taken down from the cross. The example on the left is a polychrome wood structure. Polychrome just means painted with multiple colors. It was made in Germany in the 1300s during the Middle Ages or medieval period which was a period in European history uh, from about the 5th to 15th centuries. The example on the right, by Michelangelo, is white marble and is from the Renaissance, the period we discussed last week as emphasizing ancient Greek and Roman ideals of beauty. On the timeline of art history, the Renaissance follows the medieval period and comes right before the Baroque period, which we talked about last week. Now the subject matter here is Christ dead in the arms of his mother. Which sculptures, form, and style do you think are better matched to this? And really consider this. This is an incredibly sad subject matter. Uh, it's a mother holding the dead body of her child. Uh, regardless of religious context, that's just, uh, that's just the greatest tragedy anyone could imagine. The Renaissance sculpture actually aestheticizes the scene, or tries to make it beautiful. In your opinion, is that an appropriate way to handle this kind of subject matter? And I want you to really think about which one is actually more beautiful to you, and of course, why. In our discussion of beauty and art, we're moving from ugly to gruesome subject matter and content here. This is Theodore Géricault's Head of a Guillotine Man from 1818. This shows the severed head of a man who was guillotined, uh, which is to say he was executed as a criminal with a guillotine, which is a device that essentially dropped a giant blade to decapitate him. Géricault purposely uh, purportedly based this work on a careful study of seeing such bodies in person. So apparently this is quite realistic. Do you think there's anything in this painting that indicates the artist has aestheticized his subject matter? Can you imagine what the artist might have intended by creating such a painting? And is there some kind of purpose in this extreme ugliness? So consider why an artist might want to portray such a gruesome scene. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next slide. And I feel uh, that I should give you a warning that some people may find the next image uh, rather disturbing. In our final image, we're looking at a photograph of an actual corpse. The artist, Andrea Serrano, went into the morgue and photographed bodies of men, women, and children who had died in various ways, both violent and nonviolent. Now, he did have permission to do this. Uh, he got permission to go to the L.A. coroner's office and photograph these bodies. 
nonetheless, even though he was legally allowed to be there, do you think this is ethical? Does the artist do anything, you think, to aestheticize the subject matter? Again, like with Jericho, what could be the purpose of this work? Does it offer anything other than shock value? When we're looking at it, can we begin to forget that it's a photo of an actual dead person and see it more as an abstract form or pattern of lines and color? Can you distance yourself enough that you don't think about the actual human being photographed here? Now this striking piece is an example of what can be called conceptual art, which is art in which the idea motivating the creation of an artwork is more important than the final form of its visual expression. Does it make any sense to you that the type of artwork is cons that this type of work rather is considered art even though it does not make visual beauty a priority? Do you think art has to be beautiful to be successful? And ultimately that's the big question of this week. Does art have to be beautiful? Is there some sort of meaning or truth uh, that we can find in things that are intentionally ugly and intentionally gruesome and shocking like this image here? So that concludes this week's lecture on describing works of art, talking about works of art, and the concept of art and beauty. Uh, as I leave you this week, don't forget to complete this blog to take this week's quiz, and you should be able to take a look at your first writing assignment. Now that's not going to be due for another few weeks, but uh, do read it over when you can and plan accordingly. Uh, don't wait till the last minute on those. Uh, again, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, or you just want to know a little bit more information about some of the stuff we've seen this week, please, of course, as always, feel free to email me and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Uh, so thanks again, and I'll talk at you next week. Bye.